Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Part 1 First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Global Bicycle Tours, may I help you? Yes, thank you. I'd like to sign up for a bicycle tour. Which tour were you interested in? We have the River Valley Tour coming up in June and the Mountain Tour in July. The River Valley Tour is in June. I thought it was in May. It actually takes place the first week of June. Oh, I see. Well, I can still do that. The River Valley Tour is the one I want. Splendid. Just let me take your information. May I have your name, please? Carla Schmidt. That's Carla with a K, not a C. K-A-R-L-A. -A. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Address? Do you need a street address, or can I give you my post office box? A post office box is fine. It's P.O. Box 257, Manchester. Thank you. OK, next. Will you be bringing your own bicycle, or do you want to rent one from us? I'll bring my own. Excellent. Now, we provide all the meals, so we need to know if you have any dietary restrictions. I don't think so. What do you mean? I mean, if there's any food you can't eat. Some people have food allergies or are vegetarian or have to avoid dairy products, things like that. Oh, I see. Well, yes, I'm a vegetarian. I never eat meat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Alright, I'll make a note of that. Now, the total cost of the tour is $750. That much? The price includes everything. Food, hotel, transportation, everything. Everything? Yes, everything. The only other thing is you'll want to tip the tour guide. We usually recommend 5% of the total tour cost. A 5% tip? I guess that's reasonable. In order to reserve your space on the tour, I'll need a 30% deposit. Do you need that right away? We generally ask for the deposit at least four weeks before the tour begins. The River Valley tour begins, let me see, six weeks from now. So you'll need to pay the deposit in two weeks. I think I can do that. I wonder if you could tell me something. How will our luggage be transported? Do we carry it on our bicycles? No, you leave that to us. We have a van that carries your luggage from hotel to hotel each day, so you don't have to worry about it. Great. I have a luggage rack for my bike, but I guess I won't have to bring that. No, you won't. But there are a few items we recommend that you bring. We can't control the weather, so you should bring a raincoat or rain gear. Yes, that's a good idea. And I should have my own spare tyre too, shouldn't I? Actually, you don't need that, as our guide always carries some. And of course, you won't need maps either, since our guide has the route all planned. What about a water bottle? I'll need that, won't I? Yes, you should definitely have a water bottle. A camera would be a good idea too, since that tour goes through some very scenic areas. I have a guidebook of that area. I wonder if I should bring it along. We don't recommend guidebooks. It would just be extra weight, and the tour guide knows a great deal about the area. Yes, I see. Is there anything else I need to know? I think we've covered the important points. I'll send you a tour brochure, and you can call again if you have any questions. Thank you very much.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the overseas student officer talking to some new students about the arrangements for an excursion to Ironbridge. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone. My name is Pamela Sutcliffe and most of you already know that I'm the Overseas Student Officer here at Salopian Technical College. Next Tuesday, the 28th of September, we have arranged an excursion for all new students to the important historical town of Ironbridge. We are hoping you'll all come because not only is the history of Ironbridge very important and interesting, but also an excursion like this is a relaxed and fun way to get to know each other. Ironbridge is about 55 kilometres from here and we'll be travelling by the college bus, which holds 40 people. If there are more than that, we'll bring a couple of staff cars as well, though I might ask you to indicate on the list if you have a car and would be willing to take a couple of passengers. The list I'm referring to is up there on the student notice board, and if you would like to come on Tuesday, would you please add your name as soon as possible. By the way, could you please print your name clearly? I know some people have wonderful signatures, but often I'm afraid I can't read them, which can cause problems. So if we need extra transport and you could bring your car, can you tick the car column next to your name? Could you also add your student number and your telephone number? just in case there are any last-minute changes and we have to contact you. The other information I need to give you is about lunch. There's a very nice little restaurant in Ironbridge which gives a 15% discount to the college when we bring groups. That means lunch is only about £4 and they do good vegetarian meals too, so it's usually no problem for those of you on special diets. But if you prefer to eat your own food, that's fine too, either on the bus or in the park. But I'd encourage you to try the restaurant. Now talking of costs, I should tell you that the bus will only cost you £10. And if you bring your car, we'll pay for the petrol, so you get a free trip in return for driving there. Will you please sign up by Saturday at 6pm at the latest? The list is closed after that. We will depart at 9.30am sharp on Tuesday morning, so please make sure that you arrive at least 15 minutes before so that you can find a seat and get settled on the bus. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. The college bus garage is behind the engineering workshop. It's quite easy to find. If you come here to the student union building, then walk east down the avenue until you get to the childcare centre on your left, and then turn left and walk past the sports centre and the tennis courts, which are both on your left. Cross over Central Square, and opposite you is the engineering workshop. Walk around the back, and you'll see the bus. Please wear comfortable shoes, as we'll be walking around Ironbridge and be on our feet for most of the day. Wear a warm jacket, and you might like to bring an umbrella and a backpack to put them in if the weather's warm and sunny, which we hope it will be, but of course we can't guarantee that. Certainly bring your cameras and any snacks or drinks for the bus journey there and back, which should take about an hour and a half each way. You should all check the notice board on Monday and we'll also put a note in your mailbox to confirm arrangements, so don't forget to check it. Now, why are we visiting Ironbridge? Well, Ironbridge, as the name suggests, has got the original Iron Bridge. That is, the first ever Iron Bridge in the world. It was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, and for 40 years it led the world, as Britain changed from an agricultural society into an industrial one. It's hard to imagine today that this pretty, sleepy little tourist town was one of the most important places in England for over a century. Just imagine, 200 years ago, people from all over Europe and even North America came to Ironbridge to learn about what was then the latest technology. Today it is listed as a World Heritage Site by the United Nations as they consider the unique collection of industrial monuments rank it alongside the Grand Canyon, the Pyramids and the Great Barrier Reef. One place that's fun to visit is Blist Hill, which is a reconstruction of a small Victorian industrial town where people are working and living as they did a hundred years ago. I hope you'll enjoy the day. It's been a very popular excursion in previous years, so I'm looking forward to going again next Tuesday. Now don't forget to put your name on the list as soon as possible. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear part of a lecture on some useful information for your travelling around Britain. Listen to the lecture and complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon and welcome to the session on Britain. This afternoon, I would like to provide some useful information for you about travelling around Britain. Britain has over 700 tourist information centres. You will find them at major ports, airports, 
stations, historic landmarks and towns, and holiday centres. So just look out for this sign that says Tourist Information. The staff will be able to answer your holiday queries, as well as provide essential maps, guides and brochures. Tourist information centres at major ports and airports in London and addresses of British Tourist Authority European offices are all listed on the tourist information centres. Now, let's talk about the telephone in Britain. You know, Britain is well supplied with public telephones. Street kiosks take lop coins. In city centres, mainline railway stations, airports and central London underground stations. Payphones and card phones are in operation. For the latter, small plastic phone cards are used and these come in 10, 20, 40, 100 and 200 units and can be bought at post offices, news kiosks, station bars and shops where the green and white card phone sign is displayed. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. When using the different public telephone systems, make sure you read the dialing instructions carefully. Now let's see the banks in Britain. There are 24-hour banks at London's two main airports. One is Heathrow and the other is Gatwick. Otherwise, banks are normally open from 9.30 to 3.30, Monday to Friday. Barclays Bank and National Westminster Bank offer a Saturday morning service at some of their branches. National Gyra Banks has 42 bureaux de change located in post offices throughout the country in main tourist areas. Opening hours are 9 to 5.30 weekdays, 9 to 12.30 Saturday mornings. One exception to this is the Trafalgar Square office, whose opening hours are 8 to 8 weekdays and Saturdays, and 10 to 5 on Sundays. The Bureau de Change services are available to overseas visitors. Visitors can change their money there. You can also change money at Bureau de Change, large hotels, department stores and travel agents. Be sure to check in advance the rate of exchange and the commission charged, as these vary considerably. Wherever possible, you are advised to use the bank or Bureau de Change, which conforms to the BTA Code of Conduct. In most cases, this is indicated by display of the code. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on human civilization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. 
Today in our history series lectures, Professor Smith is going to introduce the history of human civilization. Welcome, Professor Smith. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know when human civilization originated? And what's the development of human language? Well, the first two stages in the development of civilized man were probably the invention of primitive weapons and the discovery of fire, though nobody knows exactly when he acquired the use of the latter. The origin of language is also obscure. No doubt it began very gradually. Animals have a few cries that serve as signals, but even the highest apes have not been found able to pronounce words, even with the most intensive professional instruction. Apparently, a necessity for the mastering of speech is the superior brain of man. When man became sufficiently intelligent, we must suppose that he gradually increased the number of cries for different purposes. It was a great day when he discovered that speech could be used for narrative. There are those who think that in this respect, picture language preceded oral language. A man could draw a picture on the wall of his cave to show in which direction he had gone. Or what prey he hoped to catch. Probably picture language and oral language developed side by side. I'm inclined to think that language has been the most important single factor in the development of man. Two important stages came not so long before the dawn of written history. The first was the domestication of animals. The second was agriculture. Agriculture was a step in human progress to which subsequently there was nothing comparable until our own machine age. Agriculture made possible an immense increase in the number of the human species in the regions where it could be successfully practiced. These were at first only those in which nature fertilized the soil after each harvest. Agriculture met with violent resistance from the pastoral nomads, but the agricultural way of life prevailed in the end because of the physical comforts it provided. Another fundamental technical advance was writing, which, like spoken language, Developed out of pictures, but as soon as it had reached a certain stage, it was possible to keep records and transmit information to people who were not present when the information was given. These inventions and discoveries—fire, speech, weapons, domestic animals, agriculture, and writing—made the existence of civilized communities possible. From about 3000 BC until the Industrial Revolution, less than 200 years ago. There was no technical advance comparable to these. During this long period, man had enough time to become accustomed to his technique and to develop the beliefs and political organizations to appropriate it. There was, of course, an immense extension in the area of civilized life. At first, it had been confined to the Nile, the Euphrates, the Tigris, and the Indus. But at the end of the period in question, it covered much the greater part of the livable globe. I do not mean to suggest that there was no technical progress during this long time. There was progress. There were even two inventions of great importance, namely gunpowder and the mariner's compass. But neither of these can be compared in their revolutionary power to such things as speech and writing and agriculture. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.